Welcome to Nick and Dave Deep Dive the Metaverse, a podcast exploring cult classics, subculture, and geek media. I'm Nick. And I'm Dave. And we will be your tour guides today for this deep dive of Jim Henson's subversive coming of age fairy tale labyrinth. You forgot to say 1986. 1986 subversive <laughs> coming of age fairy tale labyrinth. I, I was trying to figure out how many descriptors you could come up with this one for this one. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this is this one really touches on all the things we're looking at. It's a, definitely a cult classic. This yeah. is this is hella geeky. This is a this is a three th- all three boxes movie for us. I haven't watched this movie. Uh, of course, before the the I did the the watch for this review, but uh, I hadn't watched it in probably I don't know twenty five years. Yeah. So did you grow up with Labyrinth? Because I really didn't. It wasn't in my library. No, I was I was Hobbit, Flight of Dragons, Last Unicorn, mm-hmm. um, that kind of thing. I did yeah. not have Labyrinth. I saw Labyrinth at some point, but I was a teenager. Yeah. And in nineteen eighty six, uh, I of course was not yet a teenager. I was a young child. So yeah, I. I don't know. I mean, I guess maybe as a little kid, I had some, I guess, gender biases going on. And this was filed with uh, Last Unicorn and um, what's that one with Tom Cruise and Tim Curry as the devil? Oh, I Legend. Know. Legend, yeah. Yeah. There was certain girls movies. Yeah. This and this is, was a girls movie. You know, it's funny because I'm a total fan of Last Unicorn, but um, Labyrinth and Legend were both definitely girls movies in my mind yeah um so i didn't really i didn't really cling to it so i was glad to uh do this movie uh for an episode um and i what i tried to do here is i went into it completely cold i oh, didn't yeah. google it i didn't look up anything i didn't even read the wikipedia entry on it mm, good. i just watched it and mm. and cool uh awesome it's free if you have HBO. So. Yeah, it's on. This one is HBO Max. We didn't have to hunt it down. Yeah, this one was very, very simple to get to. Yeah, so neither of us really were. This was not in our lexicon or whatever. But you went out on your your personal social media and you you kind of asked the crowdsource like, mm-hmm. what should we cover? And Labyrinth was a repeat mention. Like more than one person mentioned it. Yeah, and I could sure. say other uh, other divers have contacted me, and this has always been a, a movie that people have brought up. You should do Labyrinth. Yeah, and so I think this episode is going to be um, interesting in that many people have really fond feelings about this movie, mm-hmm. um, but I don't have any of the nostalgia colored glasses that a lot of people do. Yeah, um, so I, I I tried to give it a real honest take, um, understanding you know that this is a period piece. This is a snapshot of the age. And um, it, it it's really it was really interesting and it was enjoyable. Yeah. Um, but this was this this is probably not going to be the same review as or deep dive because we don't really do reviews properly. Mm-hmm. Uh, this isn't going to be the same deep dive as like the last unicorn was for me. Yeah, where you you really were kind of looking at your your childhood feelings and yeah well, and reassessing them with your adult eyes where i went into it wanting to love it mm-hmm. i didn't go into this with any thoughts other than yeah i like david bowie yeah so i've this now i've seen it four times wow so i'd seen it uh i remember in high school my girlfriend uh showed it to me because it was for girls of that age, it was a very like formative film. It it basically their mm-hmm. puberty is was kickstarted by this movie for a, a lot of uh, lady Gen X ladies that I know. Um, but I had never seen it as a kid, so I was like, uh, "This movie's a little cornier than you seem to think it is." <laughs> um, but I've seen it now, you know, more times as an adult and not as a, a cynical teen. And I can appreciate it a lot more. I think it depends on how much you like uh, Muppets and puppetry. Yeah. The, you know, Jim Henson's Creature Shop is amazing. They yeah. they do incredible work. So definitely, if you are a Muppet fan, this is in your, in your top 10. Yeah. And I have always been a fan of physical effects. So this is a... This, definitely. I, I enjoyed a lot of things. I kind of called those out a lot in my, in my chronological outline here. Oh, very cool. But well, before we get into that, what have you been up to lately? You know, I haven't got anything crazy that I've been doing. I haven't gone anywhere special. Um, I've just been enjoying the summer, mm-hmm. uh, loving the weather, and um, 
and all of that, playing some disc golf. Yeah. But um, one thing, one new development that I've been kind of handling it on, handling on behalf of the podcast was uh, we commissioned a new logo for the for the podcast, kind of a heavy metal band inspired. Um, like name like you'd see on a metal shirt or a punk rock shirt yeah it's very uh you know i think we asked for cyberpunk and we got something more like cyber metal but it didn't hurt my feelings i, yeah. I i'm 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 very into it yeah so divers you'll see this is going to be the new cover picture for all that i'm going to upload with with the episode mm-hmm. um it's our new logo it kind of he he channeled like a spaceship vibe but it ended up being kind of spiky and pretty cool but uh it's very legible which was a request that i made yeah um because he does a lot of um the artist's name is uh jason roberts and he does Jason v roberts right uh, what isn't it jason v roberts well on on uh, facebook he's just called jason roberts and on uh, Instagram, it's Nightmare Fuel HC, Ooh. which I can only assume means hardcore, yeah. because he's into PNW hardcore punk and crust. Yeah, and his li- logos really reflect that, so it's pretty cool. But not only do we have this new logo for the show, uh, but we also I also commissioned uh, Jason to do a, a logo for us with of just uh, our social tag, mm-hmm. so you can find us at Deep Dive the Meta on. On all platforms across the metaverse yeah and that one he definitely did go full crust punk on yeah it it looks pretty rad so you'll see us you'll see us posting these on the socials um when when it uh comes time for uh for this episode to go live and um hopefully you guys like it give us some feedback on it Mm -hmm. um i'm i'm pretty stoked it was it was really uh really well done and if you are if you are in the market for a logo for your band business podcast whatever Mm -hmm. uh, contact uh, nightmare fuel hc on instagram he will uh hook you up for a very good uh good price yeah definitely i thought his uh his prices were sort of outstandingly reasonable yeah yeah i i almost felt like like uh we had to commission two logos because it felt (laughs) it felt like it was a not we weren't paying him enough yeah for his work so how about you what have you been up to um nothing very exciting um there's a, there's been this uh, pop-up record store going on in Portland and in this warehouse space in North Portland. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I've been back twice because they're putting out new boxes of records every day. Oh, wow. Um, and it's just, if you're into into crate digging, it's a, mm-hmm. it's a really fun place to go through and, and just flip through the cool vinyl. Um, so that's kind of the, the closest thing to a geeky thing I've been up to. Other than that, I started a new schedule at work mm-hmm. um which has allowed me to get get back into working out in the morning because nice. i you know the gym shut down at the beginning of the pandemic and you go okay well you know in three months or so this is going to open back up and then i'll get back at <laughs> yeah, it Yeah, 18 months later yeah some gyms are open the one at work is is not there anymore um but you know i still hadn't gotten back to it so I've been doing like some like sledgehammer workout stuff. I know you did that for a while before yeah, the yeah. pandemic. I need to get back get back to that. I've been doing some other stuff. But you know, speaking of the pop up record store, mm-hmm. um, it's funny because there has been a pop up disc golf store, uh, <laughs> disc store. Um, this guy named. Uh, it's called Chuck's Discs, and yeah. I think he's at a bend. Is it his name really Chuck, or is it a pun? I think his name is Chuck. Okay. Uh, it's still a good But pun. it is a great name for a disc store. Yeah. Um, Chuck Discs. It, um, there's a really good sh- shop in Portland. Kind of the best one in the... I, I don't know. It's the best one in the Northwest as far as I can see. Mm-hmm. It's called uh, Disc Golf Depot. And yeah. um, uh, through the pandemic, Disc Golf just boomed with popularity. Myself included. I joined in. Um, so nobody can keep anything in stock. So this Chuck's Disc decided to come up and set up in the back room a pop-up of uh-huh. disc golf depot so they could get some synergy going bring in customers to interesting see and they serve kind of different clientele chucks does mostly like 
outer print discs and rare stamps and tour series from people and stuff like that. Of course, the disc golfs are collectible. I don't oh, know why. Oh, yeah. I don't know why I didn't think of this. Yeah. So there is there's limited edition. Oh, and, hella. Yeah. And so disc discs have print runs mm-hmm. and all Absolutely. of that stuff. Oh my goodness, dude! I drove in there at opening the other day to get the to get one that is, is super duper limited. Like they're <laughs> they're selling for like eight times. Uh, retail on ebay right now and i got one for retail so a lot of times these discs have like what i would describe as like tattoo flash image images yeah, yeah, on for them sure do you see people with the tattoos because i've it, seen i've seen people when i went to the portland open i saw people with disc golf tattoos yeah like well like regular. of the of the images or of just like Dis, other somehow disc golf sim, I symbology. Yeah, I haven't seen I haven't seen someone with like a very recognizable like that's from a disc. Uh-huh. But I've seen tattoos that could have very well been from discs. And since I haven't been in the sport for as long as a lot of these people, it's very possible. You know? hmm. Like or you'll see like a cool tattoo that has a stealth like Innova logo in it or something, which is a big company. I know. I see you're wearing an Innova hat. Yeah, I'm wearing hat. an Innova hat. I was yeah. disc golfing this morning. I went out and played eighteen uh in the gorge at bon- uh, Bonneville. Nice. Very nice. All right. Well, let's go ahead and talk about what we're drinking here. What is our podcast fuel? I um I think this is is the second or third time Culmination has come up because Culmination, I always say that's my favorite Portland brewery, but we don't represent them enough. But I happened to be there yesterday, okay, and so I wanted to get something. And this is called "At the Turn of the Tide," which of course is a is a Lord of the Rings reference. Yeah, it's got a cool logo on it that looks kind of like uh, Gandalf's staff. Yeah, the top Gandalf the White, of course. Yeah, and I was thinking, I mean, maybe this is a tenuous, tenuous connection, but uh, Gandalf knows a thing or two about a goblin king. Yeah, yeah, he <laughs> has some goblin experience. Yeah, <laughs> I think he would have handled uh, he would have handled Jareth a little differently. I think that he would have probably given him the old. Um, Glamdring. The, yeah, the old bow hammer. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been over. <laughs> yeah. But so, anyways, this is, as according to their description, uh, untraditional lager uh, brewed with the finest German malts, uh, expressive New Zealand hops, uh, Wakatu and Motuka, uh, and creates a refreshingly unique lager bursting with notes of citrusy lime zest and orange blossoms. Hmm. And, uh, I mean, I'm just as a fan of everything Culmination does, so I'm I'm into this. Let me tell you. I mean, I took a drink of this, and um, I am not a guy who dislikes a bitter beer or a hoppy beer, mm-hmm. but this is not what I expected from a lager at all. Oh, that's uh, an untraditional lager. <laughs> this was... Usually when I go for a lager, it's something that's going to be just really chill and easy to drink. Mm-hmm. Um this has got a bit of sharpness to it. A little this, more bite than yeah, you're expecting. A little bitey, a little bit of, um, I wouldn't call it sour, but there are definitely, there's some bitterness to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I don't I don't mind that at all, but it's one, 100% not what I expected. Okay. But that's not bad. <laughs> no, no it's, I'm not giving it a negative. It's, yeah. This is not a chill, crushable lager. This is this is a little more. This is a little more of a thinking man's lager. <laughs> it's a thinking man's lager. They're a thinking man's brewery. I think culmination is. They're mm-hmm. a little bit. They're they're thinking. That's why the Japanese brewers love to come and like and brew there and like hang out. They have a lot of good collaborations with uh, breweries from Japan, where the where the huh. mad scientists lurk. Oh yeah. <laughs> <sure>. <laughs> Well, why don't we take a break and get into Labyrinth? Sounds great. All right. Welcome back, divers. Uh, Let's dive into Labyrinth 1986, directed by Jim Henson. So one of the things that struck me immediately when this movie started uh-huh. was how modern movies do not have like a four to five minute long opening credit roll uh-huh. where you're just seeing names pop up for jobs like you don't care about. Yeah, that's true. I mean, generally there is title credits at the beginning of a movie, but they're, they're like more subtle. O- and more often they come after something of a cold open or or something like that this one opens up with uh 
industrial light and magic showing off the latest of computer generated imagery yeah it's an owl flying around a bunch of credits for like four or five minutes i was like wow i'm glad movies don't do this anymore (laughs) i think maybe we're you're not um not quite appreciating how impressive that owl was in 1986 like that's basically the pinnacle of computer graphics for that time sure i mean cool good on him but it just wasn't interesting and i mean i had almost forgotten that lucasfilm was involved in this and Mm -hmm. george lucas in general yeah um because i just think of this as like a henson flick yeah and so jim henson gets a lot of credit as sort of sort of an auteur of this movie um but it's way more collaborative than that um the credited screenwriter is Terry Jones from from Monty Python, mm-hmm. um, but it's a lot more complicated. Jim Henson wrote the original treatment. Terry Jones wrote the first screenplay, and because of the Screenwriters Guild, he has the credit on it. Yeah. Um, but this is also uh, Lauren Phillips did a pass. Uh, George Lucas provided notes, and then uh, a lady named Elaine May kind of tied all of the various versions of the screenplay together and made it into a a cohesive thing that kind of involved everyone's stories. Yeah, and this movie was... It's kind of interesting because this was made for $25 million, Mm -hmm. but it was not very profitable. In the U.S., it only made uh, basically $13 million. No, it's definitely... A cult classic for sure. It's yeah, not this, a, this was kind was of not a, a hit, kind of a bomb. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's weird because I mean, it had David Bowie in it, which yeah. seems like if you have this big star appeal, and then you have uh, Jim Henson's um, appeal, he was pretty huge in the eighties, and then you have you know one of the guys from Monty Python involved and Lucas involved. This should be like a money factory, right? Yeah, but you know, um, George Lucas and Jim Henson both. Uh, are very much about making the thing they want to make and commercial success either comes or it doesn't. And I think they made the movie they wanted to make, uh, but it was maybe just a little too weird for the for the theatrical market. It really found its audience on home video. Yeah, because this was basically considered um, a, a big disappointment. Mm-hmm. And it was uh, Henson's actual last uh, film uh direct that he directed yeah and um the fact that critics gave it really mixed responses uh basically kind of helped wrap up jim henson's career uh, as As a as a director uh, yeah and he just sort of went on with doing you know the stuff he'd been doing Mm -hmm. but didn't really didn't really um rock it up like he had kind of been on that on a trajectory to do yeah and so the same thing could be said for the dark crystal which was the the film he did before this Mm -hmm. one um and it was similarly kind of too weird and mixed reviews and and really became the the classic that we think of it as on home video not in the theaters yeah i did see uh i did have the dark crystal on vhs as a kid so that's definitely one that i did watch a number of times um so I saw Dark Crystal in the theater as a little kid, and I would say my impression was uh, probably terrified but enchanted. Yeah, you know, like it was very scary to me as a five or six year old, however old I was, but fascinating. Like it was just a fully immersive, weird fantasy environment. Yeah, I yeah I thought so, I thought so too. Maybe maybe we should consider doing a uh, Dark Crystal. Yeah, I've I've never seen it as an adult. And, and so there I was would... like a whole show like that came out that I didn't watch. The show was kind of boring. I don't know. I don't know if that's the popular opinion, but I had, I never finished it. Oh, okay. Yeah, and you'll watch garbage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm the quitter. You're the quitter. I didn't. Yeah. Sometimes I quit a show too. So. Um. Yeah, if I'm not entertained, I'll, I'll just quit. So basically, this movie opens up, and it's got uh, it's got the main character Sarah, and she's doing, she's wearing like some Ren Fair garb, and mm-hmm. she's out in a park, and she's doing like a dramatic dialogue reading with her dog, and there's, Merlin. Yeah, there's some swans in the background, mm-hmm. and 
And first thing I notice about this opening scene is, um, first of all, she's just hella nerd, like drama nerd. Yeah. That, um, I called it drama teen, but yeah, drama nerd is probably yeah, more accurate. Yeah, and, and I just, I thought that the music that they put over this was like super forced and it, and it was like completely unsubtle, mm-hmm. trying to make this like this, I don't know what they were trying to do, but it was like this epic, epic symphonic kind of triumphant music. I was like... A dweeb teenager in park does not need epic symphony music. Do you you think it's just, we paid David Bowie to do this soundtrack and we're going to use the music a lot? I mean, probably, but because it just seems so out of place. So the, the next two, they always wanted a rock star for this role. The next two choices, if David Bowie hadn't done it, who he was their first choice. Mm -hmm. Number two, Michael Jackson. Oh, God. And number three was Sting. Oh, man. Sting would have been so good. I mean, Bowie was great. Michael Jackson would have been good, too, but they would have been very different movies with either of those guys. I think Michael Jackson would have been a much weirder movie, and Sting would have probably been a much creepier movie. I don't know. I'm... I'm... Uh, I, I know this isn't like probably a super popular opinion with a lot of people, but I'm I'm pretty anti Michael Jackson because he's a he's a pedo and a creepo. Like the documentaries that came out with interviews of the kid kids who are now adults that spent time on his ranch, that shit's not made up. Like that's some genuine it nonsense. Would, it would definitely add an uncomfortable even more uncomfortable level to a movie that dances with the uncomfortable already yeah there's nothing overtly wrong done in this movie but it's a little creepster yeah it's it's not i mean that that we'll get to that later we'll get to it yeah so basically this opening scene didn't impress me i know Mm -hmm. whatever i'm i'm a jerk but she's (laughs) she's running then she has to run home and it's raining and and she has to get home and her um she has she fights with her wicked stepmother about having to babysit toby the annoying half brother Mm -hmm. uh and um to her credit sarah never said drops the half brother she just calls him her brother. Okay, yeah, that's true. That's true. I have a couple of half brothers, so I, I I know I know what it's all about. But basically, like this whole scene, mm-hmm. oh my god, yeah, this I, was the worst acting I have seen on my TV. Like, period. Yeah, the the stepmom bad, dad bad, Jennifer Connelly horrible, overacted beyond belief. I think. That's true to a lot of kids of that age, especially dramatic in air quotes kids. I think that's in, I think that's intentional. I, I I get what you're saying, uh, especially about the stepmom when she says her thing about the she treats me like the wicked stepmother in a fairy story. Mm-hmm. Like it's very cartoonish the way she delivers it. Um, but I think uh, I think Sarah is intentional. I think it's it is acted the way it's supposed to be. Okay, well, she never gets better. Oh, okay. We're going to disagree about this. I think- um, so I just think that Jennifer Connelly, mm-hmm. not a great actress in this movie. She's well, just she's- probably not seasoned. She's young. She's 16 or whatever. She's 14 playing 16. Okay, so she was, just wasn't a good actress at this point in her career. Um, no no hate, no shade to her later works or whatever. I'm, I'm, I'm not a huge fan, but man, this was so bad. Like the <laughs> acting was like overly dramatic it was nothing felt natural at all like Mm -hmm. every line was forced Mm -hmm. i think that's intentional it was a stylistic stylistic decision to have a bad actress no it's a stylistic decision to overact it and be dramatic about everything because that's something what you see sarah does is dramatize her life right like that's so she's making everything into a fantasy to the point that we go into a complete fantasy world. This is all a story that Sarah's sure, telling. But even even like legit dramatic kids that you've known through your life or whatever, they get real sometimes. They're not always like overblown nonsense. At fourteen, I don't know. Pretty there's some oh, drama kids can be pretty overblown nonsense. Okay, well I don't want to. I don't want to. Uh, yeah, let's not linger there. Shit splatter this whole movie right now. <laughs> but I did. I did more. say uh, 
this is in my notes too. I said Sarah is pretty insufferable right off the gate. Yeah, I don't like her at all. Yeah. I, I can't. I wouldn't trust her to. I wouldn't trust her, trust her to feed my cats, oh. let alone watch a kid. She's also a very bad babysitter. That's yeah. in my notes. But so basically, we see Sarah's room, and literally everything from the labyrinth is foreshadowed in the room. There's yeah. a there's a stuffed animal of Ludo. There's one of the the fireies. There's a music box with the princess in the ball gown that she wears later. Uh, there's a Sir Didymus doll. There's a labyrinth. There's a uh, like a bookend of Hoggle. There's the M C Escher drawing with all of the stairs. Yeah. Uh, there's a Goblin King doll. I thought that this scene, the set, mm-hmm. was overdone. I think I think that there's there's a certain amount of uh, foreshadowing is cool, mm-hmm. but uh, sledgehammering it is not exactly ideal for yeah. storytelling. I get what you're saying. Uh, I've been on a journey with this movie, and I've uh, I've been where you are, and I've come to a, a, a more accepting place with it. I mean, there are a lot of good things about this movie, mm-hmm. uh, but the, the first 10 minutes, it ain't it. Mm-hmm. I think something that definitely flew over my head a few times, uh, but I got on some of these more recent viewings, um, is the pictures of David Bowie that she has in her room. Hmm. Not of David Bowie, the rock star, but of this character named Jeremy that is her mom's boyfriend. She has a picture of him with her mom on her mirror, and she has in the... Her mom is an actress. Yeah, yeah. I got and in that. the in the playbill, you see a picture of her mom um, and and Jeremy there together, and they're they're co stars and they're romantically involved. Um, but it it makes a bigger picture of who Jareth is. Jareth is like the fantasy version of Jeremy. Yeah, and very. I mean, very. I, I guess they blatantly say it or, or imply it later in the movie that mm-hmm. this it could have all been a dream. It could have just. Yeah. yeah, this whole thing is her fantasy. Yeah, th- this isn't like no, this is real. This is a girl's imagination. Yeah, I th- I think um, I didn't. I sort of purposely didn't read any of the supplementary material, like because yeah, there's, there's there's quite like comics and stuff. Yeah, there's and... sequel comic books and there's prequel comic books, and I think everything sort of takes away from the pureness of this story, which is just Sarah's fantasy. Yeah. If you if you make Jareth real and the Goblin King this thing that exists and he comes and he enchants girls throughout history or whatever, <laughs> you ruin this movie. So I'd rather just not touch any of those comics. I mean, every, everybody does that. I mean, that was sort of like the same thing with The Crow. Yeah. The same reason we should review The Crow, but only The Crow, not any of the rest of it. Not even, I like City of Angels, I think. I think I do. <laughs> You don't. I want to. I want to rewatch that. <laughs> okay. All right. So moving moving on. She she fights with the parents. Blah blah blah. Mm-hmm. And then there's some goblins in the bedroom. The yeah. first thing that's interesting. Um, <laughs> it's legit creepy. The scene is creepy. The, as soon as the parents leave, Sarah goes full evil and summons the goblins to take Toby away. Mm-hmm. Poor Toby. I know Toby. Uh, played by Toby Froud, who is the son of Brian Froud who is the production designer or conceptual designer for this movie and for the dark crystal. Okay. Um, Brian Froud, uh, he did a book in 1978 called fairies with Alvin Lee. It's a really famous picture book of fairies and goblins and stuff. Um, His creature design is why these movies are so classic. Yeah. I mean, I think that the goblins as they're presented, Mm -hmm. Are really cool looking. Like yeah. I, I, I like that a lot. I think that these creatures are super cool. One thing that kind of killed me, killed this scene for me, mm-hmm. uh, was the fact that they had uh, Toby crying in the background mm-hmm. for the entire five minute scene, and I was like, <laughs> oh god, stop! I hate the sound of babies crying. Like it's like when you go to a restaurant and someone nearby their baby's crying, and they just are like, whatever, he'll stop. He'll stop. And they just never do anything. Just like, oh my God, you're ruining my life. So if you could summon goblins to take a baby away from a restaurant, (laughs) you should try that. You should. (laughs) Sometime you're at a restaurant, you just go in the bathroom and just look in the mirror and you say, I wish the goblins would come take you away (laughs) right now (laughs) and come out. The crying's over. Yeah. (laughs) That would be great. And so, yeah, Nick just did what uh, what Sarah did. She summoned the goblins, wished that they... She actually 
specifically said, I wish they would take him away. And they did. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that scene is, it's really evocative of like gremlins and critters Mm -hmm. and movies of that, of the same time period of these little creatures. Um, and they're usually puppets like that. So it, it feels like a gremlinsy thing. Yeah. I like these, these puppets. They're cool. But then Jareth arrives, David Bowie bursts in all goth sexy with his big majestic mullet. And he tells Sarah, no backsies. You can't, you can't call the goblins to take the baby away and then say, I didn't mean it. The, the baby's mine now. Yeah. And he's got this really cool costume. It's got like a high collared cloak. It's almost like he's wearing sort of like armor, sort of like a chest plate thing. Yeah. He's got a breastplate that's, it's supposed to be based off a German knight. Yeah. It's really cool outfit. I I like the cat, the costume quite a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, He's got a few winners. Like, yeah. there's a reason you you told me when we were discussing this. You have multiple friends who have named their kid Jareth. No, I I know one person okay. personally, but I have I have met another kid named Jareth. Other than that, okay. friend's kid. So yeah, so Jareth Jareth is something that sticks with people from this movie. It's yeah, the, it's the sort of the main thing that sticks with them. He's kind of the big deal in this mm-hmm. movie. And he does this thing uh, with juggling glass balls. Yeah, and the perspective is so jacked. Like, mm-hmm. when you're looking over his shoulder, you can tell that's, like, somebody else's hands. Yeah, Michael Moschin is the guy's name, and he's, you know, like, a professional ball juggler. And he would crouch behind David Bowie, put his arms up. Like, David Bowie would have his arms behind his back. And Michael would have his arms through the armpits and would be up there doing this stuff <laughs> blind in front of him. And this contact juggling. Yeah, the the behind the scenes footage of it is pretty hilarious. And a lot of balls get dropped. And there's a lot of David Bowie like shaking his head and laughing and this guy like swearing behind him and like cursing that he can't see what he's doing. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's pretty pretty hilarious. A lot of work went into just a few scenes with these balls. Yeah, and it's <laughs> Didn't look that cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's he, sad. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. But I think to a little kid, it looks cool. Yeah, I think I think if you're if you're 12 and you're watching this, mm-hmm. you immediately go and get like a golf ball or something, <laughs> something and, and start try, learning. Yeah. try to contact juggle. I mean, from a kid's perspective, juggling is very cool, and so that contact mm-hmm. juggling is like cooler than juggling so yeah i get it but but from just watching the movie i was like oh god those aren't david <laughs> bowie's hands this no. looks silly as hell <laughs> yeah that's that that's that adult cynicism that you you don't accept the fantasy on the well, same yeah, level because the kid perspective does. just the perspective was so off um and, and so basically it was like um like they're having this dialogue and this this line uh she's like where is he and he's like jaris is like he's there in my castle cue the totally unrealistic painting Mm -hmm. that's supposed to be a landscape and it's like it's like impressionist almost it's just like so vague there's no sharp details um and and I was like, okay, okay, whatever. This is like a fairy tale thing, and and we'll just be generous and call it stylized. Mm-hmm. But then, <laughs> when you cut over and and it to where Sarah is in in the land, like at the edge of the labyrinth. Yeah, he you, points at the castle, and then we are there in the yeah. And, and then you see like the in the foreground are the the set, and then you look in the back. It's the same blurry ass f- uh, painting. Uh, expressionistic let's let's stick with expressionistic and, and um and and i was like okay okay whatever we're in a fairy tale now everything's cool mm-hmm. and then there's a super classy dude pissing yeah that's how they open this thing the first thing we encounter is a dwarf named hoggle and he's peeing in a pond and uh he does uh apologize he didn't realize he had an audience and then he goes back to his business of uh, bug spraying fairies and and I was and I was just like uh, thinking to myself like okay that's it's kind of humorous that mm-hmm. this pissing dwarf is poisoning fairies. It certainly sets the tone for this fairy tale that this is not this is not a nice fairy tale. This is this has got a crude kind of crass uh, yeah. dwarf, and he's just like killing fairies. Yeah, it's like that's why I said uh, subversive fairy tale. It's. It's about flipping, uh, flipping the tropes 
usually and, and doing things the the reverse that you expect out of a fairy tale. I like that she calls him Hogwart. And I, it makes me wonder if that's where J.K. Rowling got the name for Hogwarts. Because it might be. That's what she calls him. Yeah, there's she gets she gets his name kind of right away. Jareth always butchers his name and calls him Hoghead and, and a bunch of different things. Yeah. Um and Hoggle, we should kind of spotlight him for a second because Hoggle is a really complicated puppet. Mm -hmm. It's got a suit actor named Sherry Weiser, who's a, a little person that is acting it out in this big head, and then she's also wearing uh, oversized hands. Okay. Um, it's He's voiced by Brian Henson, and they've got five puppeteers operating his face. So Holy this is, moly. Uh, and I think Brian Henson is one of one of the puppeteers. So it's it's a, you know, a five or six person operation to bring Hoggle to life, and he is the the co lead of the movie practically. Kind of, yeah, yeah. And so he's got a lot of weight to carry, and most of the time he carries it pretty good. Um, uh, I think I think it's kind of like after they kind of meet and they have their little dialogues, they start they kind of go into a montage mm -hmm. of them like running around like through the maze and whatnot. Yeah. And, and it's just like, th it is like the most cheese tastic synth pop being played over top of it. Um, and it, it I, this is like a montage of the worst D and D party ever. <laughs> <laughs> so David Bowie is one of my all time favorite musicians. I love, I, I mean, I dropped fifty dollars on a first pressing of Diamond Dogs yesterday. Oh. I'm a super fan. Sure, I've I've listened to this album more in the last you, few days. Do you, do you have the Labyrinth soundtrack on vinyl? No, and I I never I, had. Can it. You call yourself a super fan? I never bought it on CD. <laughs> I've never owned it on anything. I probably only listened to it once previous to this last week when I've kind of played it off and on regularly. Um, it's definitely in line with this sort of mid eighties, David Bowie, which is not a time in David Bowie that anyone really talks about. Like people like everything kind of up to the middle eighties and they like things in the nineties on, but this sort of, there's a stretch of David Bowie here that is un, not, not, I, I would say if I said underappreciated, it mean we didn't get how good it was, but there's a few David Bowie albums that are skippable. I mean, it's sort of like if you're a Metallica fan, you skip some of those middle level middle albums. Mm -hmm. The early is good, and then they kind of came back. Yeah. So this is in the in the not prime Bowie this period. Is, this is his reload. <laughs> <laughs> we, I think we discerned reload has some good songs. Yeah, on yeah, it. reload actually. Does. Is this his sane anger? <laughs> it, that's probably thematically. That's more where we are. I think. <laughs> but. It does actually. There's a couple of tracks I like, so it's not, not. It's not all bad. Yeah, but you're right. This is not Prime Bowie. Yeah, the, the music really stuck out to me as something I didn't want to listen to anymore. <laughs> 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 um. So, anyways, they do a little verbal run around, and Sarah has to figure out the right question for Hoggle to sh to tell her how to get into mm -hmm. the labyrinth. Um. And then he he basically he abandons her, and she runs around. Um. And I've got all of the encounters listed, and I don't know if we probably don't want to mention every single one of them. The first one is the little Cockney worm. And the perspective is super jacked and weird. Yeah. Um, but the worm repeats something that Hoggle told her about not taking things for granted. That's kind of like the first lesson Sarah has to learn mm. is to not... Because she thinks you get in and the outer ring of the labyrinth is just one contiguous hallway, but there is passages they're just not visible ah gotcha yeah i think that some of these encounters are s totally skippable mm -hmm. but the it should be called out like i really liked uh seeing the goblins who are wearing their like armor and helmets and weapons and stuff mm -hmm. they looked super cool they kind of reminded me of some of the drawings of the uh, characters in like heavy metal. Oh yeah. Uh, that have like the oversized helmets with spikes on the top and stuff like that. Like, I just thought that was cool. Um, and, and I, I, I really enjoyed those puppets and I thought they were, they were neat, but then they get to that one scene where like 
Bowie is in the middle of the room with all the goblins, mm-hmm. and then he starts. He goes into a musical number. Yeah, Magic Dance is the song, and all of the puppets start moving like animatronics at a Chuck E. Cheese. <laughs> and it's just like, okay, the eighties were a thing. Yeah, it's really weird because literally any time you mention this movie to someone who loves it, this is the thing that they talk about because you say. Like I told someone yesterday, the next podcast is on Labyrinth. And they go, oh, you remind me of the babe. And they they go into that whole bit. The mm. It's a it's a Cary Grant, Shirley Temple bit from a, a movie from the 40s that Bowie reappropriated. Gotcha. But that is the thing that everyone remembers is this moment. And to me, it's one of the kind of like weakest like scenes in the whole movie. But it's... It made an impression on people for some reason. I didn't like the song. I didn't like the Chuck E. Cheese dancing. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'll say this. Jareth is a baby, better babysitter than Sarah is. Oh, yeah. He's, he, he's making sure that kid's looked after. Toby's having a good time. And one thing I'm curious about, do they ever explain it in the extended universe? Why are the goblins all hideous, but Jareth is handsome? Oh, probably. I don't know. I don't like I said I avoided the whole extended universe thing. I mean he's the goblin king but is he actually a goblin? Is he just like a fairy, a fae creature he's like more an like elf? an elf? Yeah, who he's is more the, like an elf. Who is king over the goblins? Yeah, I don't know. I think really he's more like Sarah's idea of what a sexy man is as a as a kid. Okay. You know, he's not literally a goblin. He's king over the goblins. Yeah, I mean that's that's sort of the conclusion I came uh, yeah. came to. There's a couple of tropey uh, tropey encounters they have after that. Mm-hmm. Like you get to the two two guys. One tells the truth and the other one lies. Right. Um. And all of that. And and once again we get Sarah doing some uh, extreme overacting in this mm-hmm. scene. It gets, it gets, uh, super dramatic. There are some moments in the middle there, like when she's interacting with Hoggle and whatnot, where I think the acting was pretty good. Yeah. And I think that she was actually like, that's how a person would react, you know, like to some of these situations. But then there are other times when she's reminded like, Oh yeah, I need to be theatrical. Right. And, and she goes back into that, um, overly dramatic overemphasized uh mode and and that happens a bit in here so what you should remember here in this or when you look back at it think about this when sarah is being rational and using critical thinking Mm -hmm. she advances in the labyrinth and when she goes into her like fantastic thinking she has setbacks huh so she solves the riddle of with the two guards, right? Of which door to go through. Sure. And then she gets on the other side and she's like, oh, this was a piece of cake. I'm smarter than I thought I was. And then, boom, she falls down the hole. Every time she starts going back mentally, like into the that, that behavior that you're talking about, mm-hmm. something bad happens to her. And when she's rational, she gets to move forward. Yeah, I can see that. Um, cause she rationally solved it and then mm-hmm. she got a little, little lame and full then, over herself. Yeah. Boom. She's in an oubliette, which I, I had mean, to look up. I, oh, it's funny. I knew what an oubliette was because, uh, you're I, a dungeon master. I, I, I'm a dungeon master. But also when I was a kid, I played magic, the gathering and there was mm. a card called oubliette. Um, but yeah, this, I was like, man, that's a dark thing for, uh, that's a dark thing for a, uh, a kid's movie yeah. essentially, which is just like a pit prison where you let people rot to death. Yeah. It's a, according to Webster, it's a, it's a dungeon that only opens at the top. Yeah. Rough. And then we cut over to, to Jareth and he's not happy with how far Sarah's made it. And mm-hmm. he reveals Hoggle's a plant. He has Hoggle in there that he's supposed to he's supposed to be leading Sarah backwards through the labyrinth back to the beginning. Yeah, and and I think it's it's pretty funny how he he essentially he threatens uh he threatens Hago with the bog of eternal stench. Mm-hmm. Um you know, which that sounds like every teenage girl's worst nightmare. Mm-hmm. It's a stinky place. It something it the this movie is set up in a way like that I thought 
that a, a fantasy story would be set up as a kid. Like it's the mm-hmm. way you would tell a story, and then this happens, and then this happens. Yeah, it's like a it's whole, super linear. It's a it's a very and then this uh, sort of movie, and that's uh, I saw a little interview with uh, what's his name Terry Jones, and he had said like he wrote the movie that way. Like he was like he basically had a stack of Froud's drawings, and he'd get to the next point. He's like, all right, it's time for another encounter, and he'd be like, oh. Then he, she meets these things, and she he would pick a, a creature from the stack and be like, and write an encounter, basically. Yeah, I mean it's it's extremely simplistic. It's like a it's like a um, it's like a D and D module that she's running through, where you just yeah. have to go oh, through totally. the dungeon and go from room to room and encounter each little thing, and then you'll 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 encounter the boss at the end. This would actually be a pretty good like introductory dungeon to run someone that was you were just introducing them to role playing you could do it in one session oh yeah yeah That's, yeah just, that would be pretty fun yeah i mean so i mean this is this is kind of um this is just kind of a weird scene here where mm-hmm. they you know they're in the they're in the the tunnels down below and there's this uh cleaner machine which is right. like this death drill thing and it reminded me of indiana jones yeah um and and they're pounding on the wall and eventually it breaks down yeah and they they encountered Jareth down there in in mm-hmm. in the dungeon because he's he's spying on them basically yeah um and it's like that's all it's a it's pretty inter- it's it's definitely um there doesn't feel like there's any stakes like there's no stakes beyond what Sarah's ready to handle there's always a way out um they're not really in danger it's just a exciting story yeah, I mean, air quotes, exciting, <laughs> exciting to Sarah. Um, but so they they end up climbing up this ladder and they come out through a pot in a courtyard. Mm-hmm. Uh, and while Hoggle and Sarah they're kind of bickering, this old wizardy man with a bird on his head shows up. Yeah, for like half a second, I thought it was a skexy. With, oh yeah, it's it's got a because the long neck. Yeah, the and long the neck face, and the yeah. beak face. I was like, oh no, there's like a dude under that. Yeah, that's a hat. And so when Sarah's making their introductions, I thought this was worth pointing out. She tells him that Hoggle's her friend. And that puppet does the best acting in the whole movie right there in that <laughs> scene. Because he like he reacts to hearing that word and he looks at her like, did she really just say that? And I was just like, Bra- bravo, Hoggle. Like, bravo, the team of puppets. Like. That was really good face acting. Yeah, and then like a little bit later, she said, "He says I ain't never been no one's friend before." Uh, I thought that was pretty pretty cool, and it actually reminded me of the Doc Holiday scene in Tombstone. Oh yeah, he's her uh, Huckleberry, <laughs> or, or when you know when it, it basically Doc Holiday said, you know, like Wyatt says, oh, "I got a lot of friends," and uh, and Doc's like, "I don't." Yeah, it's just like okay. It's this very special moment, you know. It's like that's that's a good movie for man moments. That's a that's a great that's a great movie. <laughs> I, I love Tombstone. It's one of my favorites. Have, quick, quick tangent. I won't go far on this. <laughs> Have you seen the trailer for the documentary about Val Kilmer? It's just called Val. No, oh, that man, it looks that? good. It looks it's soon. It's going to be on hmm. Amazon or Netflix. I don't remember which one. Um, and it's got all this footage because he's he was something of like a, a home video guy, so he's got tons of footage. Um, and it doesn't just, it seem a little premature? It's not like he's dead, right? Nobody. Um, he's he had his battle with cancer, and he can't speak so really he well. Really act anymore? No, I think he's going to be in Top Gun, the the Top Gun sequel. But yeah, and he was in he was in Jane Silent Bob also. He doesn't do a lot of acting because he can't talk. Um, or he speaks very, you know, like with the, with the mm, thing oh, on the brutal. neck. Yeah. Anyways, it, Val Kilmer is a big deal to me. So it, it tugged at my heartstrings. That yeah, trailer. yeah. I, I watched that. That sounds awesome. For sure. Um, but let's get back to this. Yeah. So next comes Ludo. Yeah. Ludo. Uh, they go through this hedge maze and they hear Ludo roaring and hoggle like, quickly abandoned sarah he's like nope i'm back to being yeah, a coward yeah it turns out hoggle he's a real piece of shit 
He's not a good friend. He's not a good ally. He's he's sometimes a turncoat. Yeah. He's he's a real Theon. <laughs> Theon Greyjoy. Yeah, he has a similar arc. <laughs> Hoggle has a parallel arc to Sarah. Like Hoggle and Sarah both do a hero's journey in this, which is the it's an interesting interesting thing. Like because he exists in her imagination, but he has his own character arc. Yeah, I mean. I, I don't I don't love Hoggle, but um, I, I thought Ludo was cool. Like, Ludo, he, who is, you know, this big beast being tormented by goblins, um, he's pretty cool. Yeah. I so he's he, loyal. So he looks like a big orangutan with horns, and he can talk to rocks. That's very useful. The, the rocks are the deus ex machina for the rest of the movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Sarah frees him, and do, 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 he's joined the party. He's now He's now part of the squad. Yeah. I, I I like Ludo better than Hoggle for sure. Ludo is a pretty great character, and he's so it's a. Uh, there's two different guys that portrayed him on inside the suit. They alternated, mm-hmm. and then probably the same mass of puppeteers that operate his face. And there was basically inside the Ludo suit. There's two screens that the person operating it can see. Mm-hmm. One um, that is like back at a video village where you're looking at the whole set and one that's on one of his horns. And that's the field of vision. As far as like what's in front of you is a little like pin camera up on one of those big horns. So he's Jeez. very blind. Jeez. That, that's, that's cool though. But that's why Sarah often you see Sarah leading him or hoggle kind of by the hand. Like she's always holding hands with them. I think it's cause neither, neither one can really see anything. Yeah, I think I think that that's that's a pretty cool scene with with uh, Ludo. But I mean, it kind of cuts away again, and like we have um, what we have. Uh, oh yeah, we have Hoggle abandoned her, and then he has a com- conversation with Jareth. Yeah, and Jareth is like um, basically heckling Hoggle, mm-hmm. like you think she likes you. Yeah, you're. A- miserable little what is i don't remember what he calls him a wretch or whatever but it's like if she kisses you i'll make you a prince a prince of the land of stench <laughs> <laughs> and i was like okay that was funny but he's yeah. a dick jareth is a dick to hoggle like he really treats him bad um and he gives hoggle a poison peach um kind of a la snow white which was one of the books we saw yeah in, in sarah's room um he now hoggle has to give sarah this peach i mean is it at this point where we i mean you kind of mentioned it already just this, this is so fucking linear like <laughs> there's no thinking involved in watching this movie no nope. it's just uh and then has then this happens then this happens i mean was this made for children or was it made for adults or i mean because it, it feels <sighs> It feels pretty tedious at this point to me. And I know there's probably some divers out there that are like, oh my God, there's so many amazing scenes. But it's like, dude, there's this is this is boring. It I think the movie is made for adults and children, both. Um and I think adults are supposed to uh have a get a meta message from it mm-hmm. that's beyond the children who just appreci- appreciate the fairy tale style and of the it. puppets, yeah, which it's very much patterned after Alice in Wonderland and the Wizard of Oz, and you know where the wild things are. Like, I the, mean, and they even show where the wild things are in her mm-hmm. bedroom. Yeah, this is they very much right out the gate. They tell you this is what we're emulating. Like, yeah. we're we're subverting the tropes of these books essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it is supposed to be linear like that, but there is a there's a story for adults there that you you you're supposed to pick out. You know what I mean? You're supposed to do the do the crunchy thinking about what this represents. But the kids aren't going to see that cuz they're they don't have the perspective to care about what it represents. Nick's on record. Kids are stupid. <laughs> <laughs> no, kids have never kids are still kids. 
and they've never had to reckon with becoming adults, which is what the movie's about. Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, so, so I mean, I think, you know, there's another scene where they have... Kids the, are stupid. The, <laughs> oh, Nick's <laughs> fully on record. I want to say I'm not on record with that. Um, then there's the scene, what would you call them? The Fireys? The Fireys, a.k.a. the Fire Gang. Yeah, probably the worst green screen work in the whole movie. <laughs> and there's a lot of bad green screen work. This is crap. Like, straight up ex- acts this scene. I bet you they didn't because they spent too much time making it. They couldn't bring themselves to it. Yeah. It just looked so bad. I have a hard time disagreeing with you. I think the fiery scene especially... Um, Although I think the Chili Down song is is one of the catchier songs on the soundtrack. <laughs> I think the scene is a little rough. Really, my only note about it is Kevin Clash, a.k.a. Elmo, is one of those fireys. Um, I think this is pre-Elmo, but he's doing the Elmo voice. Yeah. So, like, the seeds of Elmo are, are here. And Elmo's probably, like, one of the most long-lasting, like, modern sesame street characters like late introduction characters so you know that's cool i mean we don't need to preserve elmo's legacy though i mean (laughs) elmo's legacy is solid we there's not (laughs) nothing we can take away from elmo (laughs) yeah he's he this could have been cut and he'd have been fine yeah Uh, so basically um of course hoggle comes back and and helps her get away or whatnot and of course because you can't say something's gonna happen and then not have it happen Mm -hmm. she kisses him yeah, and he's convinced that's why they they fall down this hole and find themselves in the bog of eternal stench. Mm-hmm. That Jairus cursed him, and because of that kiss, that's why they're there. But actually, it's just Chekhov's bog, and you can't introduce the idea of a bog of eternal stench without deploying it later in the story. Yeah, exactly. This is, it's just it's a thing that had to had to be introduced, and then there's a super annoying... and Ludo's there. That's where he ended up. Yeah, we and lost so they, Ludo for a they make bit. a nice little D&D party here. It's three. And then we get our our fourth member soon. Mm-hmm. They meet, what's that guy? The noble knight? Sir Didymus. Sir Didymus is also super annoying. Oh, I love Sir Didymus. Like, I think of this party, we have Ludo, who's cool, the rest who are annoying. <laughs> uh, fair, but I like, I like Sir Didymus. Sir Didymus is classic Muppet. He is a, a yappy dog slash fox. Yeah, he kind of that pretends to be a knight. Mm-hmm. Uh, he With rides an eye patch. Yeah, he rides around on a sheep dog, uh, similar to Sarah's dog. It's Merlin. Some would say it's the exact it same dog. Probably is the exact same <laughs> dog. What was um, with those sheep dogs in movies in the eighties? Like those were everywhere. So specifically, they uh, use the sheep dog in this movie because it's the most muppetable dog. Because okay. they have to, they alternate back and forth between a real dog and a puppet, and a sheep dog is all hair, and it's just very easy to make a puppet of. Okay. So they, I think other dogs might have been considered, but the sheep dog was the just the most it's muppety just dog. Easy. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, th- these guys are, are are going around, and and uh, it turns out Ludo can summon rocks with his growls and howls or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, we've we've already seen him do it once, mm-hmm. um, but. Sir Didymus is the guard of this bridge. And, and they just have to ask him if they can cross. That's yeah, it. Just he be sw- nice. He swore a blood oath that no one would cross the bridge without his permission. And so you just have to get permission. And then that's it. What kind of blood oath is that? I don't know. It's a fairy story blood oath. But this is another <laughs> good example of Sarah has to logic her way. To, to move forward, she has to logic her way. Mm-hmm. And so she just had to use logic as opposed she didn't have to beat him in a fight or anything like that. She just had to ask. Um, but the bridge is old and shitty, and it falls down immediately, leaving Sarah stranded out there. So, like you said, Ludo summons the rocks. Yeah, and then they get through this obstacle, and finally... And, and then she's like, oh, damn, I'm I'm super hungry. Hoggle's like, here's some food. Here's, here's, here's the single peach I have. Because in a fairy tale, you always eat the fruit that is given to you by the sketchy person who's turned traitor several times. Mm-hmm. Again, this is a time when Sarah does not deploy her skepticism 
And so she has a setback. And then she gets turned. Yeah. <laughs> she she literally gets sucked up in a bubble and goes to, I called it a, a side quest. She goes and does this whole side quest where um, she is at a ball mm-hmm. with all of these people in goblin masks and... She's wearing the fancy dress from the from the music box back in her room, and she has this whole fantasy with Jareth. Yeah, and I did not love this scene because it felt like... Uh, so first of all, I think that Jareth is creeper. Mm-hmm. Um, I also think that the funhouse mirror shtick at the end is a little bit... I don't know. It's a little on the nose, funhouse mirror and a bad trip, etc. Yeah. Um, and, and, and she goes and she escapes that place and she gets found by a witch and then mm-hmm. she wakes up and she's in her room, but she's not. It's yeah. a terrible trick by the pack rat witchy lady thing. Yeah. So I think, so for me to kind of everything past Sir Didymus, the movie's dragging a little bit, mm-hmm. but I think thematically this isn't a really important part of the movie. Because the what the lady wants her to do is to get buried under the the tropes and the, like the collection of her childhood, mm-hmm. right? In the whole movie, this is about Sarah growing up, and the lady's like, "Here's all of your toys and all of these things," because she has this room like you talked about where you're just sledgehammered with all of the the stuff that she has in the room, and she starts piling the stuff onto Star- onto Sarah, and essentially trying to make her into another trash lady and trap her here in the in the labyrinth under the weight of her childhood fantasies. Um, so I think thematically this is a really important scene. Yeah, I mean, she's trying to... They're trying to make this into, um, you know, another lesson mm-hmm. about how things, materialism, etc. Like, I think there's a lot of things you could try to take away from this. But I don't think it's specifically materialism. I think that's... It's, it's just like the trappings of all these things. It's it's specifically her holding on to her childhood fancies in an unhealthy way. You know what I mean? Like, not uh, being a prisoner to them as opposed to dealing with them rationally okay and i mean this scene ends uh not super uh you know it's not very it's not a crazy climax or whatever Mm -hmm. she just gets rescued by ludo and sir didymus she realizes the trap and then it falls apart Mm -hmm. and they're there but they don't rescue her she rescues herself. Oh, okay. I mean, and so then they go into the Goblin City. They finally make it to the middle. Yeah, they're there. And there's a scrap iron golem. <laughs> Is that the proper D and D? I I mean, I would. I mean, I think it's just a. I called it a big robot, but I like your description better. Yeah, it's it's like an iron golem, but it's junky. So mm-hmm. I call it a scrap iron golem. Yeah, I don't know. And I I think that this whole battle thing, um. You know, Hoggle comes back and mm-hmm. rejoins the party, and um, basically, uh, it's just like they're not doing battle with her. They just like there's no battle to be had. This is Benny Hill with goblins. Oh, totally. Yeah, the Hoggle saves the day. Like, there's a little bit of actual danger, maybe with that big robot mm-hmm. uh, or scrap iron golem. I like that. Um, and Hoggle does his final face turn, right? Where he, he turns good and stays good for the rest of the movie. Um, and then I just I called it a, a big Muppet battle that ensues afterwards. Yeah. And that's all the notes I took on it because, I mean, there's no point in us going beat by beat through all the stuff that happens. No, because it's just Benny Hill with goblins. Yep, totally. But at the end of it, they prevail because of uh, Ludo being able to call the rocks because that's the... The kind of end all be all. If you call the rocks, it's all a wrap. So I was watching this with Carrie and uh, my wife, who Mm -hmm. after after this battle, Mm -hmm. um, she said, "The rocks are the real MVP in this movie." (laughs) I thought that was funny. They kind of are. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Well, I mean, Ludo, who can talk to rocks, let's not not downplay Ludo's involvement. No, but yeah, Ludo and the rocks were the real MVPs in yeah, this movie. Definitely the most valuable member of the party. Sir Didymus just rides that dog around. Yeah, Am- he's... Ambrosia, that's what he calls it. Or Ambrosius. <laughs> Ambrosius doesn't want to <laughs> fight goblins. 
Sir Didymus is basically useless. He is, but um, he gets all the jokes. Sure, sure. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, he's a color commentary guy. Yeah. Um, and then and then she's like, I have to do this alone. <laughs> because that's the way that it's done. And mm-hmm. they're like, well, if that's the way it's done, that's what you must do. But if you ever should need us, Sarah, you just call on us. That's important. It gets called back on later. And then she walks into the Escher puzzle. Do you think they paid royalties on that? You know, I bet they had to to have it on the wall. I bet they had to probably do... So they probably just used the hell out of it once they paid the royalty once. Yeah, so that is an M.C. Escher lithograph called Relativ- Relativity from 1953. Um, very famous. I with- mean, who doesn't love M.C. Escher's art? So good. He's so awesome. good. Yeah. Um, and... Remember that time when we were at that show and we saw that that do that that music duo called MC Escher and DJ Tanner? It's pretty <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> they had a Casio keyboard and like I remember really bad that, rapping. I remember that name, but I can't. It was at one of those Scarlet Theater shows. Um, oh, and yeah. the guy the guy was rapping as as MC Escher and DJ Tanner was rocking the Casio keyboard with the samba beat and stuff oh, like the was, pre-programmed uh, beats. It was pretty entertaining. It was like those, a comedy act. Those were really fun shows. Yeah, it was, it was really fun. Shouts to uh, Jessica who put on those shows, uh, like real underground hardcore shows in Vancouver, Washington, which does not have hardcore under- shows. <laughs> underground hardcore shows. For a while, we had some really cool. They're a mix of like metalcore bands and experimental bands. Like those were really fun shows. Yeah, I agree. That was fun. But I just remembered that that just stuck out to me right now. MC good, Escher good call. And DJ Tanner. I don't think I'm. I used to do promote. I'm used to make flyers for those shows, and I don't think I did one for that show. I wish. I wish I had. I have got a bunch of cool flyers for bands that ended up being big bands. Oh, that's awesome. All right, so back to this movie. <laughs> she leaves the party, goes alone, walks yep. into an Escher painting, and she's there. And, of course, so is Jareth. Yes, and we get my favorite song from the soundtrack, Within You. This actually is a bop. Like, this is a good one. Hold on a second. I call this the Creeper song because he's a grown-ass man talking to a uh, underage girl and he's saying within you he's talking about being in her no it's it's pretty implied this is a gross song no it's not i've gone on the whole journey with this where this is a gross movie and i've come did, back did, around. did you go and analyze the lyrics really carefully here's this is not a lyric from the song but this is uh, something that he tells her and i think this is i called it this is when jareth really lays the truth on her I'm exhausted by living up to your expectations. Mm -hmm. He is her fantasy that she made up. He does everything that she wants him to do. He doesn't exist. He says, you cowered before me and I was frightening. Basically, everything that he has done is just what she's wanted him to do. So he is just her fantasy. He's in her head, not in her baby box <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's in her mind i i, I understand that mm-hmm. is what the idea was is that i'm from you i'm f- i was i am a creation of you yeah i'm but i don't think it's worded well <laughs> <laughs> you, it could be less ambiguous <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah <laughs> i won't fight you on that i mean he could say within you I mean within your mind. <laughs> or like like you created me in your mm-hmm. fantasy or something like that. He doesn't need to be like just creepster about it. Like yeah. and I don't think that there was any there were no, there were any scenes in here that were overt uh in their inappropriateness. I just think it's a tone. Yeah, it's just and that's why I'm glad it's David Bowie and not Michael Jackson or Sting. <laughs> yeah, then it's over. I think over. I, I don't know. Sting hasn't really he hasn't really had too many scandals in his life. No, I don't think Sting has any scandals, but I think Sting I mean, this is gonna be a weird commentary. I think Sting's sex, sexual energy <laughs> is at a more um a more aggressive stance than so, David so, Bowie's. So are we gonna give Sting five star sexual energy? <laughs> <laughs> it's off the chart. 
think <laughs> think think back to uh, to Dune, oh, right? Yeah. When he comes it's, out it's there over. in the cod piece, <laughs> and they wanted to do that scene fully nude, and the studio wouldn't let them. So <laughs> <laughs> that's the problem. Sting would be like, "I don't want a cod piece. I want my real dick print." <laughs> <laughs> Sting would take it to the next level. Okay, okay, he yeah. would. He would. He would go. He would go next level. David Bowie knows where the line is, and he's happy to do his magic dance yeah, right on the line. He's, he's wearing a fairy outfit, and he's dancing ten feet away from her. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's fine. And then, of course, it ends when she comes to the realization: you have no power over me. Yes. Ta-da! Done deal. Movie's over. They're back home. Toby's back in the crib. The owl that may or may not be real flies off. And then there's a Muppet party in her bedroom. Yes, that, that basically that is all that happens. There's a scene preceding that where she she talks into the mirror mm-hmm. and everyone appears behind her. All the all she her calls party her, her ba- them back. Yeah. And they all are kind of doing their final goodbyes. And Sarah opts to not do a final goodbye and thematically stay a child. She's not ready to be a full-on grown-up. Yeah. I mean, and I guess And then they have a Muppet party. That's how I called it, too. Yeah. I mean, they have a Muppet party in the bedroom. It's over. And that's that. So what really worked for you? What are your personal highlights from this movie? My personal highlights. Number one, Brian Froud's creature design. Supplemented by Jim Henson's creature shop and their puppeteering. Mm, Chef's kiss. So good. I love all the goblins and the just all the little the the four the four guards that are like Alice in Wonderland playing cards. Yeah, the, yeah. Those, those are cool. things are cool. Ludo is cool. Hoggle is amazing. It's all that stuff's great. David Bowie, caveat mostly. David <laughs> Bowie acts great against people. So when David Bowie acts with Hoggle, he's great. When David Bowie acts with Sarah, he's great. When David Bowie acts with actual puppets, eh, it's boring. I don't believe that he believes that they're real things. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he doesn't sell that. Um, we're, we're, we're in highlights still. We need yeah, to... but it, I had to. You had to caveat. That. I had to caveat that one. I think Jennifer Connelly is great in this movie. Mm. Um, I think the overacting is intentional for the character, and it's used to show her maturity throughout the movie. She doesn't overact at the end the same way she does at the beginning. She goes on an arc. And I think that was all intentional. Um, It's a story of a young girl learning to deal with her adult feelings while still remaining a child. And I think it nails all that. Like, it it really tells that story. Um, What about you? Um, I thought mostly similar things, obviously. Um, I liked Bowie in this movie. I thought he was a really great Goblin King. With Mm -hmm. no Bowie, this movie is nothing. Mm -hmm. Um, I really like the old school puppetry. I like Muppets and stuff. And so I really enjoyed the the goblins the character design was great like those goblins really really were awesome i i again i also liked ludo and all those other uh characters that were um like sir didymus was a cool puppet like i basically liked all of the the puppetry that was really cool um and i think that's pretty much where it ends for me Mm -hmm. those two points were were the high points in this movie Mm -hmm. so for you what did not work for you so the movie, it drags pretty bad in the back half of the movie. Mm-hmm. Like basically once the party is assembled, the whole thing up to until the climax, like it is feels like a slog. Like that's it's probably only like 17 minutes of film. I mean, this movie was longer than the Snyder Cut. <laughs> <laughs> it really wasn't. It's not even two hours long. I know, but... but it. It feels long. It feels longer than an hour and forty-five minutes, mm-hmm. um, and I think that let's cut ahead to the next one. That comes down a bit to Jim Henson's directing. Um, Jim Henson, I don't want to besmirch him because I think he's a a true genius. Like I think he was really a visionary, creative, um, but I don't think he's a great feature film director. I think neither does the box office. Yeah. It, I think he shoots a movie like he's shooting an episode of The Muppet Show, but with a bigger budget. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing, there's no, like, 
No interesting cinematography. Anything interesting he does with camera placement is just about hiding puppeteers. It's not about, you know, like a, a vision. Like he's not like a, a visual. He's a visual artist, but he's not a visual artist that way. Sure. So there's that. Uh, like I said earlier, I'm a huge David Bowie fan. And this is not a great soundtrack. It's not a great David Bowie soundtrack. And the creepy thing. We yeah. already we already <laughs> talked about it, but there's some creepy creepiness to this movie that especially in 2021 feels very cringe as they say. Oh yeah. What about for you? What didn't work? Um Jennifer Connelly's acting Boo. throughout. Her acting is good. She's a treasure. She <laughs> is not a treasure. She is what you would call an also ran mediocre Hollywood actress. Oh. Um I looked up her filmography and I didn't see anything in there that I thought was amazing. And the good movies she was in were not good because of her. They were good in spite of her. Oh, um, ooh, I, I do not think she was good. Um, <laughs> I do not think the music was good in this movie. It mm. took away from everything. The musical numbers where you have David Bowie dancing with the puppets or when you have the puppets doing their little musical things mm-hmm. here and there. Just no thank you. Absolutely no thank you. Those scenes were lame. Mm -hmm. Uh, Just straight up. I mean, come on, but just take it for what it is. I'm a Gen X dude. It's not for me. So I thought it was lame. Maybe a 12-year-old girl would watch it and think it's awesome. (laughs) Um, I think uh, you are right that uh, that, uh, Jim Henson is not a good director. Uh, This movie is extremely linear with no interesting diversions nothing that catches you unaware it's just like you said before and then and then and then and then it's over yeah and it was just like okay cool dude i'm glad it's over so that none of that worked for me and and again once again the creep the creep factor you don't you don't need a 14 year old girl playing a 16 year old girl lusting after a middle-aged dude that's just a bad look I didn't like that. Don't you think, though, that it rings true on some level? That ki- like a, a person of that age, boy or girl, there is going to be adult people in their life that they have feelings for that they don't quite grasp. That's normal, uh, right? Yeah, probably. I'm just not so sure I want to watch a movie about it. Yeah, it's uncomfortable. Yeah, it's yeah. It's just not a movie that it, it's not a it's not a topic I really want to watch a movie about. I don't think it would get made today. <laughs> no, I think I think I think every actor would every every one up for the male lead would be like, I'm not touching that with a ten pole. You know what the I think the most recent big cultural phenomenon that I think is thematically similar there is the whole Twilight thing. Oh, uh, maybe. And maybe. I think that's the last one through the gate. I don't think we're going to get a lot more of teen girls in love with an immortal being things going forward. I don't I think we've gone we've gone we're done with that. Yeah, I think I, th- I think it's it's good that we're done with that. Mm-hmm. It's really troubling <clears throat> when you start unpacking it. Yeah. Okay, so what are your final thoughts wrap up and rating of this movie? <sighs> I've been vacillating as I always do on my on my final rating. Mm-hmm. Um, ultimately, I I come down on the the three plus, um, where I think it's I think it's a classic for a reason, and there's a lot of great stuff going on, um, but it's too flawed to get that four or five star rating. But I think it's it's signif- It's still a significant film. Uh, so three plus. All right. Well, I was really thinking about this and I think if you had asked me what I was going to rate it before I watched it. Yeah. Because, uh, I, uh, divers just a look behind the curtain. I have a notes template that I do for every episode and mm-hmm. I copy it and I paste it, the blank version in, and then I just start filling it out and fill it out before I watch the movie. Oh. Sometimes I, you know, like first impression like when did i originally see this movie yeah. some basic data when was it made etc mm-hmm. um and then i usually put a rating on there 
if I've already seen the movie in the past. Oh. And this is my, this this would be, you might call it my rose-tinted rating. Yeah. My rose-tinted rating was was a three plus, oh. but I've watched it. It's you, a two plus. You, went, you dropped down. It's not good to watch right <laughs> now. Like, it's just, it wasn't actually enjoyable. I was like, I want to turn the fucking channel like there's got to be something better on than this <laughs> like i bet i could go to youtube and look at the trending top 10 and find something in there that i would enjoy more than this divers um if you haven't if you don't feel super attached to this movie and uh our assessment of it didn't uh really like turn you on to wanting to go see it Go see Pan's Labyrinth. Oh, God. So good. Guillermo del Toro. That just guy's is a, a genius. Ge- yes. If we're talking <laughs> genius level creators, I tr- I think he trumps Jim Henson in my book. Oh, yeah. I, he's he's amazing. Del, I'm a, yeah. Del Toro. I'm on board for everything. The whole, fil- <laughs> the whole filmography. Even the movies I haven't seen. I'll tell you, it's at least four stars. <laughs> Well, maybe not Blade Two. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm with you though. Go see Pan's Labyrinth, and I do want to sort of be an apologist to the people who absolutely love this movie because I've been you. Yeah, I've been the person who loves the movie from the '80s or whatever. Who other people are shitting on it, and I do, and I don't like to. I mean, I kind of do, but I don't. I don't like to hurt other people's feelings. That doesn't yeah. make me feel good. Um, but a realistic watch of this movie from someone who has zero nostalgia about it mm-hmm. is that it is deeply flawed and it is not actually very entertaining, aside from in a visual way. Yeah, because the pe- puppetry is cool, but the plot is not complex or no. interesting to an adult mind. It is no. not something that should be uh, an hour and 45 minutes. They've got about 30 minutes of content. You know what? If you like Jim Henson fantasies, there's probably a DVD box set of Jim Henson storytellers where those were just 30 minute fairy tales. Huh. And that shit was fire like those were really good i i haven't i haven't uh seen that stuff yeah jim henson storytellers look that up pan's labyrinth from guillermo del toro and jim henson storytellers watch those those it's a better use of your time than this movie was yeah. so this this movie i i don't i don't like to dog something that i consider a true cult classic mm-hmm. usually if something is a is like a true cult classic i will um I will try to give it the benefit of the doubt, but in this case, um, it's just, it's just, I have to be, I have to be honest about it. And, and looking back, like if you haven't gone and listened to our, um, our re-rating extravaganza or whatever we called it, (laughs) um, I didn't, I haven't rated that many things at two. Like I've, I've really not, um, dogged that many things, Yeah. but this one, it, it goes in the dumpster. I think um, even though I rated it higher than you, I think you have adequately justified your rating. Like I, I don't, I don't have a counterpoint. I think you've made a, you made your case, and it's solid. All right, so we got a three plus and a two plus. Which, if you were not here for a re rating and you're not familiar with our ratings uh, style, is we we rate on a one to five, but the plus can be added, but only to represent it has a culturally significant impact with regard to uh, cinema. Yeah. So we're. I'm just saying that this wasn't a good movie, but it's a it's a loved movie, so it, it has the plus. Um, I haven't given a lot of a lot of those pluses out but um you know this one gets it it's, there's a there's a reason why you go to any comic con- convention or whatever and you're gonna see a, a jareth yeah you know maybe three if <laughs> he's not deadpool like you're not like oh, deadpool and harley quinn which you're just buried under obnoxious drama kids sarah would be a harley quinn like that's the character she is <laughs> she dressed up like. I, I was re- speaking of that stuff I, I i was watching or i was reading a facebook mm-hmm. uh thread of comments and stuff and someone someone said something like lame or shitty or whatever and then someone else immediately commented the guy with the deadpool uh user icon 
we immediately know that you're a douchebag and not to listen to you based on your user pick. Yeah. It's like, I like those movies. I like, hey, I'll go, I'll go farther. I love Harley. I love Deadpool. I love the Joker. Those are all great characters. The people. They have some toxic fans. They have really bad, like, Joker especially has toxic fans. (laughs) Yeah. Deadpool and Harley just have obnoxious fans. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's that's true. And not all of them, obviously. I don't want to yeah. paint with too broad of a brush. Um, but, you know, in any fandom, there's always going to be certain ones that ha- that attract more mm-hmm. uh, more people that are annoying. I just figured I'd throw that out there because you, you mentioned, uh, mentioned Deadpool. So let's go ahead and <laughs> uh, take a break, and then we will come back with our closing segment. All right. Welcome back, divers. It's time for that final segment, the one where I ask Dave, what are you into right now? All right. Well, I haven't been uh, deep diving content like I normally do, um, like with movies or books Mm -hmm. or whatnot. Um, So I just want to give a shout out to some of the music I've been listening to. I enjoyed talking about Fear Factory's new album. When I listened uh, to that. Last week. What'd you think about it? That's good. I guess last episode. Yeah, it's really good. And then it made me go back and listen to old Fear Factory. Yeah. So that's really, really good album. And so um, I've been actually working on some of my own creative endeavors, doing some writing and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So um, I've been listening to mostly music while I do that. So Mm -hmm. I want to spotlight two albums that came out this year that are worth listening to one is kind of uh mainstream and the other one is underground so i figured i'd I'd do a little taste of both i think i know what you're gonna say and i already agree on both of them are you sure i think so okay let's find out okay so the the mainstream one is light the torch you will be the death of me you like that one? I liked it. Okay, so this is if you don't know who Light like the Torch is, they are a super group, mm-hmm. air quotes. I don't know. I don't really like that term, but it does have people from other bands, like Howard Jones is the vocalist, yes. and he was from, of course, Kill Switch Engage and other bands. Mm-hmm. It has Francesco, uh, Francesco Art. Artisato, I don't really know, but from All Shall Perish, mm-hmm. uh, Ryan Wambecker from Bleeding Through, yes. and a drummer who's a dick, um, who uh, they actually had to change their name because he wouldn't let them use uh, uh, their original name, which was Devil You Know. Oh, right. Um, okay, yeah, I remember so that. So they switched their name from Devil You Know to Light the Torch when the drummer quit, and he and he said he owned the name and was <laughs> blah, blah, blah. So now they got a new drummer. They got the guy from Whitechapel, Alex. Rudlinger, who's a who's a like a really good metalcore, like yeah. fast drummer. Anyway, so this is metalcore. If you don't know what that genre is, it's heavy. It has harsh barked vocals, but then it has fast uh, melodic triumphant parts, usually with clean singing. Where Howard Jones is doing his thing. Howard Jones as a vocalist. If you're not, so I use Howard Jones for. I like heavy metal, but I don't like those vocals that you can't understand. I go, yeah. let me introduce you to my friend Howard Jones, yeah. who has this amazing voice, like soaring voice. Yeah. Um, and people that like want metal, har- like hard metal, but want to be able to understand the words. Howard Jones is your dude. Yeah, he's the reason I listen to this band. Um, mm-hmm. Ultimately, I think that he is extremely uh, gifted as a vocalist. He's yeah. one of the best vocalists in metal. Um, and so I really like this album. I think it's super good. I don't think that this is breaking new ground, just like mm-hmm. I said with Fear Factory. It's for fans of their previous work or yeah. for of this genre or heavy-ass music but that has really good and understandable vocals with excellent melodic parts. Yeah. So that's what you should check out if you like that. It's called uh, You Will Be the Death of Me by Light the Torch. Um, I like that a lot. And so the second one, the Underground album, I am i don't think you're going to get this one. Okay. Right. Maybe fine. you will. Maybe you will. It's uh, Harakiri for the Sky. Yes, I knew that was uh, going to be it. Did you? Because you already told me about it. Oh, you, okay. You sent me a link to it. To check this out. So yeah. I've listened to this album on repeat. It's the album... Uh, um, it's called uh, Mare. It's like M-A-E, the, the combined letter. Mm-hmm. So this is a duo from Austria that formed in 2011. 
and they are classified generally as um, post black metal, and they have um, just extremely diverse uh, parts in here. Everything from clean guitars, pianos, and really spare drum parts, all the way to extremely fast uh, black metal parts that are melodic in nature. It, it's uh, it invokes the terms like black gaze uh, mm-hmm. pretty often. Uh, and this is really for fans of like Alcest, Wolves in the Throne Room, early Woods of Ypres, um, that kind of thing. Or I would even say that the um, Agaloc fans could really like this too. Mm-hmm. So this is this is a really great album. If you don't like um, you know black metal vocals, you may not like this, but the instrumentation in this is just top tier and it's only two dudes so that makes it extra interesting to me yeah so i listened on your recommendation i listened to both of these albums over the last week Um, okay and i think i've probably played this one twice and the light the torch one once um and and i was describing it to someone else as post black metal and i wasn't sure if that was right but i I Googled it, and Google affirmed yeah, I, I got the right subgenre. You're definitely post. Uh, I think there's some there's some crust in there. Like it's it's black metal, but it's pulling from a wider range of influences. Yeah, totally. Um, and I liked it quite a bit. I think it's really good. I think both of those are really good albums and good bands. Yeah, the, I, it makes me. Um... Like whenever you hear some some older bastard be like, "There's no good music made today. The best music was made." Blah. blah, blah. It's like, dude, you're just you're just not finding new music because you've closed your mind. If you mm-hmm. if you look, there are amazing albums being put out every single year. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you are a person who's looking for good metal to listen to, there's a uh, YouTube channel called uh, Banger TV. Yeah, that is just awesome they do like amazing uh youtube videos about like what's coming out this month that's awesome and they review things they do in-depth single album reviews Mm -hmm. um i watch them i'm subscribed to them on youtube and i watch Hmm. their their previews like what's coming out this month and then i just go to my youtube music and i just add them all to my collection and listen to all of them and if i don't like one i just take it out of my collection it's very easy yeah um and so it's really, really helped me grow my uh, kind of my different genres of metal that it's, I've been listening to. It's really easy to fall into those ruts, right? And get into the... I'll all just the, listen to Alice in Chains again. All the best <laughs> music came out miraculously when I was 16 years old. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's like, it's so weird because my dad thinks all the best music came out when he was 16 years old. And it's so weird because it's really when I was 16 years old, the best music came out. Yeah, people people just need to understand yeah. that um, it's okay to have nostalgia trip bands. Sure. And that's fun and it makes you feel good. That's the, literally the crux of this podcast. <laughs> yeah, but you should listen to other music too. Yeah. So uh, Be like have- Sarah. And learn to balance the two things. Also have Muppet parties. Yeah, and don't be a trash lady with a pile of shit on your back. Have balance. Don't eat peaches from <laughs> traitorous dwarves. You can't trust a dwarf without a beard. It's like the dwarf is measured with his beard. <laughs> That's funny. All right, so what have you been, or what are you into right now? You know, I've gone all around on whether or not to do this because it feels so out of step with the podcast okay and i thought I, a couple of times i'd be like i'll, I'll recommend the the new black widow movie because it was really good or i'll recommend the new afi album because i've been listening to it a bunch mm-hmm. but really the thing that i've been into is a youtube channel called the hoof gp the hoof gp it is uh this guy named graham parker he is a, a Scotsman, okay. and he is a professional hoof trimmer, and he <laughs> he trims cow hooves. Cows, not horses? Not horses, cows. Yes, he goes to farms, dairy farms, uh, cattle ranches, etc., and he trims the hoofness, or he trims the hoofs and prevents lameness in cattle, um, and he... He has over 300 videos, over 800,000 subscribers, and I'm one of them. 800,000 for hoof trimming? Yes. And I have watched... I don't think I've watched 300 videos, 
but I've watched a lot how, of how long videos. are these videos usually hmm, 17 minutes okay. they're short basically you know he'll in a day he goes out he has this thing called the crush and it is a it's a apparatus that you you herd the cattle into and you get them in there and you can basically pull up their leg get the grinder out and you trim their hoof and cattle and any hoofed animal they naturally have natural main self-maintaining hooves right like yeah. their hooves are like fingernails but in in our sort of the environments that we keep animals in especially dairy cows who Just are in some mushy in, field or in concrete sheds right yeah and so there's lots of things where they can get they can damage their hooves and they need to have those lesions and, and ulcers and things taken care of it's sort of like if you ever watched like any of the animal planet vet shows or if you ever watch like the Dr. Pimple Popper videos. Oh, God, that's disgusting. That some people are super into. It's sort of like the intersection of those two things. Okay. Where it's like it's veterinary care and a little bit of grossness. But there's this sort of satisfaction when when they heal an animal that has an abscess or something. And they trim the hoof and you check back and she's better afterwards and like... It's just real wholesome content, and I'm, like, hooked on it. I watch so many of these videos. Holy crap. I'm So, just the background, I'm from a dairy family. Like, I come from dairy farmers. And when I was a little kid, I used to get quizzed on cows. Like, when we would drive around, it'd be like, Nikki, what kind of cow is that? And I would have, I would know, that's a Holstein, that's a Jersey, that's a Guernsey. That's an Angus. Like, I would know the different breeds of cows. Mm -hmm. So it really, culturally, it, it hits me in this in this cow centric. And you kind of live in the country. And I do. And I love I love cows. What? I just come to terms with that. I love cows. I like to watch. When are you going to get some cows? Oh, jeez. I don't want to do this. And I don't want to pay <laughs> Graham Parker to come and trim their hooves either. Although I've watched a lot of videos. I might be able to just wing it. Do, <laughs> do a... I hope... I would ruin a poor cow's hoof. Don't don't let me trim your cow's hoofs. <laughs> no, I won't. I'm never going to get a cow. Yeah. But anyways, if any of that sounds appealing in any sort of weird way to you, I definitely recommend the Hoof GP on YouTube. Okay. Definitely not going to watch that. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you like it. So call to action. So subscribe to us on your favorite podcatcher and rate us generously. A five-star review costs you nothing, but means everything to us. And in the future, we're going to be doing something related to this uh, this ratings thing. So so make sure make sure you figure out how to do it and get it done. And yeah. uh, we'll we'll come back to this later. Yeah, um, you can find us on all social media platforms as Deep Dive the Meta. Uh, we are on Instagram, which is my preferred. We are on Twitter, which Dave likes, but we're also on Pinterest, which no one likes. Well, I guess this is really goodbye. Don't say goodbye. Say good journey. <laughs>